Christine Chambers, who is also based here at Halifax. Um, she is the Canadian Research Chair in Children's Pain and a Killa Professor in the Departments of Pediatrics and Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University, as I mentioned right here in Halifax. She's based in the Centre for Pediatric Pain Research. Dr. Chambers is a clinical psychologist whose research is aimed at improving the assessment and management of children's pain. She's published over 150 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and was identified as one of the 10 top most productive women clinical psychology professors in Canada. Her Canadian Institute of Health Research funded the It Doesn't Have to Hurt initiative for parents, which generated 150 million content views worldwide. It trended nationally on social media and won multiple national and international awards. And it was also featured in the New York Times and the Globe and Mail and on CBC's The National. Amazing. Dr. Chambers holds leadership roles in the International Association for the Study of Pain and the North American Pain School and is a member of the CIHR Institute Advisory Board on Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis. A leader in patient engagement and knowledge mobilization, Dr. Chambers has given numerous public presentations, including at TEDx Talk. She's the scientific director of recently established National Knowledge Mobilization Network with over 100 partners called Solutions for Kids in Pain. Headquartered at Dalhousie, <coughs> excuse me, the program's mission is to improve children's pain management by mobilizing evidence-based solutions through coordination and collaboration. Please join me in warmly welcoming our Dr. Chambers. So anyhow, thanks for that kind introduction, and thank you for including me in your um, your gutsy learning series. Uh, just started to get to know um, Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I'm been really grateful to have them join us as a partner in some of the work that we're doing that I'm here to tell you about today. So um, I'm a scientist, I'm a health researcher, I am trained as a clinical psychologist, but I spend most of my time doing research. And researchers, we get ideas to do studies, we write grants. Uh, we hopefully get, eventually, the grant. Um, we conduct the study. We publish the study in a you know, scientific or medical journal. We present it in a scientific or med you know, medical conference. Um, and then the cycle repeats itself. Uh, and there's a bit of a problem here in the way that science works in that there really isn't a direct mechanism um, for science to get into the hands of people who can use it. But every grant that I've ever written, um, or reviewed, um, or read, um, always includes a promise from the research team that the research will eventually um, benefit patients. But that doesn't always happen. So that's what I'm here today to talk to you about, is pain and also sort of a bigger <coughs> issue of the challenge of getting research into the hands of people who can need it, whether it's patients or health professionals. And part of the challenge is there's just a huge volume of science right now. So on average, two and a half million scientific articles are published every year in different journals. There are estimates that the global scientific output will double in the next nine years. And uh, sadly, you know, most of the science um, probably doesn't get read. Uh, there are some estimates that as many as, uh, you know, 50% of published scientific articles are never read by anyone other than the people, the scientists that wrote the article, um, and the journal editors and reviewers who handled it at the journal. So, uh, a lot of patients in the general public think that scientific discoveries move rather quickly into practice, but we know that's not the case. There are various studies that have estimated that it takes on average 17 years for the results of research to find their way to the front lines. And we also know that it's a really leaky pipeline. So only about 14% of clinical research uh, ever becomes available to those who need it. And again, there's lots of barriers and challenges along the way, and part of it is the way that science works. We don't reward scientists, and we don't make it easy for them to get the word out. So what is the consequence of this? It means that roughly a third of patients do not receive evidence-based treatments that are based on the sort of cutting-edge literature. We know that a quarter of patients um, receive care that is not needed or is potentially harmful. 
And also, large portions of patients and physicians report not having the information available um, that they need to make um, medical decisions. And if you think about that 17-year estimate, for those of us who work with children, like 17 years is an entire childhood, right? Like a whole generation of kids who miss out on the benefits of scientific knowledge we already have. So I work in pediatrics. I study children's pain management, and children experience pain from a variety of sources. This is a child in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, the children also experience pain from disease, as you would be very familiar with, um, in, with IBD and other types of uh, chronic illnesses or diseases. Uh, we also know that even healthy children undergo um, painful procedures, say, for vaccinations. Uh, so pain is a very cross-cutting issue. Um, but it's only been recently that our attitudes towards pain and pain management have begun to shift. And as recent as the 1970s and 80s, it was widely believed that babies didn't feel pain, uh, especially premature babies like the one in this slide, that their neurological systems were too immature to feel pain. And so they were often given nothing for pain, no anesthesia or analgesia for very invasive procedures and even surgeries like heart surgeries. They were just given paralytics so that they wouldn't move, but they were given nothing for pain. Uh, and although we've improved our practice tremendously, um, there are still many ways that we fail children and adults when it comes to pain management. Um, where there are evidence-based solutions, we'll talk about what some of those are, um, that aren't provided. A recent study of children's hospitals in Canada found that hospitalized children experience on average six painful procedures um, in a 24-hour period, and over two-thirds of those procedures are um, administered without any pain control. So again, there's a real problem. We have a really robust research evidence around procedure pain management in kids, but it's not being used. So uh, I mentioned you know, that we have come a long way, um, but again, there are still lots of different places where there are areas where we can improve. So even vaccination pain is a great example uh, because we have decades of research that have been synthesized into systematic reviews. There's even a national clinical practice guideline and we've presented to the World Health Organization who adopted many of our recommendations. Um, yet at the end of the day, we know that most children don't receive any kind of pain management for vaccination. And certainly, uh, we all know from the media that vaccine hesitancy, is, uh, vaccine refusal is a big problem right now. I mean, the measles are back in town. And uh, although pain isn't the primary reason why parents don't get their children vaccinated, we do know that one in 10 children and adults have a significant fear of needles that causes avoidance. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides because it's the baby who's getting the needle, but it's the father who's feeling the child's pain. And this slide really summarizes most of my research over the last 20 years, uh, which is focused on what parents say and do, uh, how parent behavior impacts children's pain. We do know that pain is a very complicated experience. Uh, it's a subjective thing, um, so the only way to really figure out how much pain someone has is to ask them. Um, and of course, in certain populations who are nonverbal, young children, um, those with disabilities, it becomes even more challenging to access that subjective experience. Uh, we know that pain is influenced by a variety of biological factors, so that could, could include things like genetics, or hormones, uh, as well as psychological factors, anxiety and depression, um, and social factors as well, such as um, you know, how people act around you or cultural factors. Um, so all of these things play together um, to impact your pain experience. We run studies in our research lab at the Center for Pediatric Pain Research with something called the cold presser task. So if you put your hand in cold water and you keep it as a standardized device, it induces pain. And we use it as a tool to study um, people's reactions. And it's fascinating to me that we will administer the same stimulus to the same types of kids 
and some kids rated a 10 out of 10, some rated a 0 out of 10. Everything's held constant. Um, pain just has tremendous variability attached to it. Uh, and um, because of the complicated nature of pain, there isn't one strategy that works to, uh, to manage pain effectively. So we know that there are pharmacological strategies, so medications do play an important role in pain management. And in the context of the opioid crisis, this has become a pretty complicated space to be for pain clinicians. Um, but the reality is medications are often a part of pain management plans and do need to be used uh, properly. Uh, physical strategies, um, so positioning and movement and physical activity, we know that there, these are also really important in pain management. And uh, finally, psychological strategies, so cognitive behavioral strategies, mind-body techniques, uh, and as a psychologist, I'm especially interested in these. We have done some specific research over the years on um, pain in children or youth with IBD. This is a study we published this year in collaboration with Jim Gottlieb um, from GI at the IWK and a colleague at Sick Kids, um, and found that, uh, sure enough, um, youth who have high levels of pain associated with their IBD had much lower levels of quality of life. So this whole issue of moving research into practice has really become a passion of mine over the last five to seven years. And it was partly motivated by my own experiences as a mother. So these are pictures of some of my kids um, having interactions with the medical system. And I realized that my own children weren't benefiting from the science that I had dedicated 20 years of my life to contributing to. And there were times where I had to advocate really strongly for my kids to receive what I knew to be evidence-based pain management based on sort of cutting-edge science. And my husband's an anesthesiologist, so between us, like, we are an interdisciplinary pain management team. Um, and even then, um, you know, it was hard for us um, to make sure that our kids benefited. And it made me worried, like, what about every other kid who don't have parents who have this expertise and comfort in advocating um, based on the science and can kind of bring up the articles and say, well, no, he's not too young to use patient control analgesia because here's the study that shows that kids of this age can do this. So I did have the opportunity um, in 2012 to take part in something called the Mayday Pain and Society Fellowship Program. And this is a program that takes people like me, researchers, clinicians who study pain, um, and um, give us training in media and advocacy and policy. And it was during this fellowship that I learned about the um, just increasing use of social media. And up to this point, I was on Facebook to connect with high school friends. But I never had thought about how I could use social media in a professional capacity. But as you can see here, oh, and some of the, I think, the slides, have, some of the text has disappeared. But um, there's been a huge increase in the number of social media users over the last decade. And uh, when I first started doing work in social media uh, to mobilize knowledge, I started getting teased a lot by my colleagues and rejected from conferences. People saying, well, this isn't science, Christine, you know, what are you doing? Uh, I was reassured when some of the major journals like Nature and Science started publishing commentaries about the value of social media in science. Uh, this one graph, I'll uh, sort of guide you through it a little bit, but it summarized the different ways that scholars were using social media, so it included things like posting their own content, discovering peers, um, you know, following uh, other people's content. So lots of different reasons why academics and scientists were starting to use social media. But I knew that there was still a stigma out there because the day after Nature published their commentary and figure, uh, there's this comic spoof called PhD Comics, and they um, published this comic about why academics really use Twitter, and it's things like, you know, it gives me something to do during a boring seminar or interact with someone that I have an intellectual crush on, right? So they're just kind of mocking why scientists would ever use these tools. But the reality is, when I wanted to reach parents with information about children's pain, social media is a place where many parents, especially younger parents, are going. So you can see here that you know, roughly two-thirds of moms and dads 
are finding parenting information while going online and on being on social media. And over a third of them are asking questions um, uh, directly. And that really worried me as a health professional and a scientist because, you know, if we're not there engaging, who's answering those questions? And what responsibility do we have as scientists and health professionals to be there when patients and families start looking for information? Um, and this slide went viral before this image a couple years ago, and all of my medical friends were laughing. Ha, 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 like, please don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. And I thought it was very disrespectful because the reality is, um, you know, patients, of course, are going to go online looking for information. It's the most accessible way we have. It's, it, it is part of our fabric. And I still have medical colleagues who will tell a patient sometimes, like, you know, don't look at, don't look this up online. Like, don't you know? Well, of course they are. So that should have sailed. Um, and again, what responsibility do we have to make sure the quality evidence is there in, in a way that patients can engage with? I loved uh, Trish Greenlaw, who's an implementation scientist, sort of posted this retort. So, doctor, don't confuse your Google search with my six years of medical school patient. Don't confuse the one hour lecture you had on my condition. Dur um, you know, during medical school with my 20 years of living with this condition, right? So again, speaking to the value of the patient perspective and the incredible experience, lived experience, lived experience expertise that patients bring to the table as well. And as an example, who do patients find if health professionals don't put themselves out there in terms of engagement and getting health information? They find people like Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, they find people like Jenny McCarthy. And these are really two prominent examples of um, how influencers can infiltrate the health space um, with a lot of, um, you know, we'll say fake science um, and influence people while we remain hesitant to engage. So what we did, which um, is part of my fellowship, I applied for and received a $10,000 uh, knowledge sharing support award from the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation to uh, create a video um, in which I wanted to share research evidence with parents about how they could be better manage needle pain, but do it in a way that isn't the typical boring scientist video where we're reading off of cue cards and white coats, which we're really good at doing, um, and create something that parents might actually find more accessible. everyone today. You're gonna get some needles today, young lady. Yeah, we are. Thanks. Stop! You know, Mom, it doesn't really have to be this way. I know if we have needles, but I don't have to be. You can distract me with some fun games and get me to take a few deep breaths and play my bed You can even put a special cream on me so the needle won't hurt so This could all be a lot easier. Do you use topical headaches to help? Do you the swing me skis or the sing a song? Do you the, the cord me? to take some deep breaths and play with my lab Don't tell me it's gonna be okay. Don't tell me it'll be all of it. That can make me feel worse. It's better to take my mind off of it. Well, they don't tell me. Come here, Bubba, please. This has been really helpful for me. Please share this with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, distract, take deep breaths, use topical anesthetics, and don't say, it'll be okay, or it'll be over soon. To learn more, visit our website. So we put 
put the video on YouTube just over five years ago, and I learned a really important lesson, which was not only is it hard to create compelling content as a health professional and researcher, but it's even harder to make sure it gets in front of all the people who could benefit from it. I had used all of my grants on producing the video, and I hadn't really thought about how I would disseminate it. I um, e emailed it, you know, researchers use email listservs, I posted on my personal social media, and then I just kind of ran out of ways to get it in front of people. And so I learned the hard way that, you know, if you build it, they won't necessarily come. Um, and the video has had, uh, you know, nearly, I think, a quarter of a million views on YouTube over five years in uh, over 150 countries, so it has had good reach. But I was frustrated by my ability to get it out there in the way that I really wanted to. And so that's when I started tweeting. And my lab had signed me up for Twitter the year before, and I had told them I would never use it. It was a waste of time, but they were sort of like, well, just humor us. Um, and as soon as I had a reason to, which was I had this video that I wanted to share, uh, I took out my iPad and I was like, I guess I'm going to have to figure this out. Uh, and I learned very quickly that if you could start targeting influencers on social media who had large followings, like Andre Picard, who's the health reporter at the Globe and Mail, um, you know, they would start sharing. I also started targeting parenting media because as a parent, I'd pick up all these parenting magazines and be super frustrated um, by the fact that there's a lot of information there that isn't based on science. And one of the places that I targeted was yummymummyclub.ca, which was an online community for Canadian moms that I was a part of, led by Erica M. And if you grew up in the 80s and early 90s like I did, you might remember Erica from her days at Much Music. She was the first female video jockey um, in Canada. And after she had her own children, she created this online forum for moms. And I was thrilled when she wrote me back and said, I love your video, I'm gonna you know, flag this for one of our bloggers to write about. Um, and a few weeks later, this um, blog post appeared about our video uh, on the YMC site, uh, and the video was embedded. And because we were tracking the views on YouTube, we noticed that there was a huge jump in the number of views that day. And that gave me an idea, which again is like, why am I trying to do this myself? I do have the science, but there are people who know how to message to parents and um, have an established reach. And when I looked at the reach of YMC at the time, across all their different social media platforms and partner networks, they had a reach of over 5 million Canadians a month, which was exactly the audience of people that I wanted to get my message in front of. So I reached out with the idea of a partnership. Could I bring this science, but Erica and her team take that science and literally knowledge translate it into compelling digital content and get it out in front of Canadian parents? So I tweeted her and said, would you like to write a grant with me? And she's like, what's a grant, you know? And I said, well, don't worry, I'll walk you through this. So we did submit a grant to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and we're delighted when we were funded to create a 12-month social media campaign called It Doesn't Have to Hurt. And our goal was to share not just procedure payment information, but information about a range of pain issues that Canadian parents were struggling with with their kids. Um, and we were funded to not only develop and implement, but to evaluate the campaign. And the campaign capitalized on the rise of brand and content, which is a really prevalent um, approach in marketing. So everything we created in the campaign was branded with this logo, it doesn't have to hurt. And patients could link back to the original website and actually get to the original articles if they wanted them for it, but they, you know, the messaging was more parent friendly. Um, so again, this was some of our branding for It Doesn't Have to Hurt, um, which we were thrilled to launch in September of 2015. And how it worked was Canadian, a, a group of patient and parent partners helped us to identify the areas that parents would like information on. So day surgery, um, you know, uh, what to do when your kid has, you know, menstrual pain. Uh, we did do a few special um, topics. We did cover pain in children with autism. We did cover pain in children with arthritis, for example. Um, and what happened was the researchers then would, okay, those, for each of those topics, we would identify from the medical journals 
all of the most important research that have been done and synthesize that and literally turn it into just a one-page evidence summary. We would turn those evidence summaries over to YMC and they would pull out all the information, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, of and turn it into really cool digital content. They would push it out across their platforms and then our um, amplificate our reach with Amplify by engaging lots of different partners, including the Canadian Pain Coalition. Nothing went live without the approval of both the scientists and the uh, patient partners so that um, everything was sort of validated before it went live. So these are some of the blog posts that appeared on the YMC site, typically written from the perspective of a patient sharing their own story, but what we did was seamlessly embed research evidence within the patient narrative so that not only was it a compelling personal narrative, but it was evidence-based. These are some of my favorite content, the social media images, mostly posted on Instagram. I wasn't even on Instagram. My lab tried to convince me, I'm like, I don't get it. It's a bunch of pictures set up. But this is where young parents are. Um, and because of our partnership, I didn't need to be there. And again, these were beautiful and very simple. So for example, here's one, breastfeeding and needles equals it doesn't have to hurt. That image in three words summarizes decades of research, randomized clinical trials that have been published in journals, summarized into systematic reviews, but at the end of the day, what's the take home message for parents? Um, you know, breastfeed your baby during needles. We also had YouTube videos where patients uh, shared their stories. And it was interesting because working with this um, digital marketing agency, they really pushed us to consider strategies we wouldn't normally use, um, including uh, how a bikini wax inspired a mom to manage her daughter's pain. Our research team was mortified when this came by. Um, but our patient partners loved it. Like, uh, they were like, I would totally watch this. Um, and so we really had to learn, like, what are the scientists bringing to the table? Is the evidence accurate that's in the video? Yes, let's trust our partners around how to message that. We also had very um, popular Twitter parties where patients could come online on Twitter at an advertised time using our it doesn't have to hurt hashtag and um, ask conversations, directly engage with scientists. Um, and so these were really, really successful. We trended um, nationally on a number of occasions, and once we even crashed this sick kid server, directing so many patients to a pain assessment tool for children on the sick kids website that they hadn't known existed. Uh, and again, as someone who's been trying to get people to talk about children's pain for 20 years, um, seeing um, the interest and exposure was really rewarding. In the world of medical research, it can take up to 17 years for research findings to be used in everyday life. That means that research that can help children who are suffering in pain sits on the shelf while their parents desperately search for answers. It Doesn't Have to Hurt is a groundbreaking social media initiative that helps make evidence-based medical research available to those who can benefit from it instantly online. Because of this unique science media partnership, the conversation between scientists and parents took off around the world on social media using the hashtag, it doesn't have to hurt. It made such waves on social media that Twitter Canada invited everyone involved in this special project to their headquarters to celebrate, and also to use their Twitter Live video app to reply to parents' questions about their children's pain live. In today's world, success is often measured in view counts and likes. But in this case, what matters most is the impact of the initiative on parents, children, and researchers. This program is so important to get information that is evidence-based out to moms like me all across the country, all across the world. So we have a way to feel empowered. I'm able to meet, uh, reach thousands and uh, millions even of parents who are able to then improve the outcomes and reduce their child's pain. Parents of children who are suffering needlessly in pain are absolutely desperate for information that's going to help them to ease the pain of their children. I feel like a program like this, first of all, allows people going through um, chronic, pain, chronic pain and just any type of pain to let them know that other people are going through that because often 
it's kind of like the silence, that thing that you don't talk about. It's not just about busting the silos amongst organizations, like the children's hospitals, for example, but it's also across the sector. So not just the, the, ch the big children's hospitals, but connecting with the community hospitals, the children's rehab centers, the home care agencies, so that everybody has this information. It's all about sharing it and like the more knowledge we have, the better we can help our kids or or even just be better advocates for our kids. Well, look, it's the dream of every university that your faculty are not just great teachers and researchers, but they're engaged with the public. So that we're bringing that research to life and that research is informed by the public as it is tonight with the questions on Twitter. This initiative has been a catalyst for changing the way scientific research is shared with the people who need it most. And the conversation isn't stopping now. Together, we will continue to harness the power of social media to help children and the people who care for them know that it doesn't have to hurt. So what are we doing next? Uh, we were thrilled recently to receive funding from um, the federal government, uh, Network Centers of Excellence Knowledge Mobilization Initiative, to create a new initiative called Solutions for Kids in Pain. Um, it Doesn't Have to Hurt was directed to parents, which was wonderful, but parents are only one of many knowledge users in the system who need research evidence um, to be able to use it in practice. Patients themselves, children, as well as health professionals, policymakers, and so we really scaled up our initiative um, to include a much broader approach. And uh, SCIP represents a key partnership between Dahazi University, where I'm based, and Children's Healthcare Canada, which is a not-for-profit organization in Ottawa that includes 48 different health institutions from across Canada, including all the children's hospitals. So together, we are working to promote evidence uptake uh, across Canada. And uh, sorry, the visuals are losing a bit of their color here, uh, but as you can see, we have uh, sort of across Canada spread, and we have knowledge brokers who will be based in Halifax, in Toronto, in Ottawa, in Edmonton, who will work to help um, promote evidence uptake in these areas and um, across Canada. And importantly, we're using a patients included approach. So this is not just for patients, Patients are actively engaged in, as team members in all of our activities, um, including our management and also serving on our board of directors. We have over 100 partners and we're thrilled to have Crohn's, um, or, uh, uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada as one of our partners and we've already had some discussions around some specific tools that we can create together uh, for patients with IBD um, as they relate to pain and I'm really looking forward to being a part of working on those together. And again, our four goals, sort of the activity areas, uh, we are working on assessing readiness for change in different health institutions, uh, pulling together existing resources, identifying gaps, um, and then producing new tools, like the ones I just mentioned, uh, and making sure that they get promoted to the right audiences. Um, again, the facilitation of change, it's not just enough to make information or tools available. You have to work within health institutions to understand the context and the needs of different patient populations. And then we're also uh, working hard to increase public awareness about pain in children and pain in general um, and create a sense of urgency. And to that end, we've had a series of launch events over the last month for our SCIP network. This was one in Halifax on injecting innovation into healthcare. We had a very successful event in Toronto that profiled um, the pain management needs of children with disabilities um, with a focus on cerebral palsy. Uh, and we also had an event in Ottawa on April 30th in which we engaged with parliamentarians, members of parliament, and senators around the importance of pain management and why it's important to um, address this and make sure science benefits those who need it. And I just got back from Edmonton this week, I don't have a slide on that one yet, where we also had an event. So uh, that's how I'm trying to deliver on this promise that we make as scientists to help patients. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity to grow this work. We have a booth about Skip in the hallway, Lindsay, who's with us from UBC, uh, learning about knowledge mobilization. Um, so please come visit us and on our website, uh, everyone can be a part of this so you can register to receive more information and, and join our efforts. So thank you.